Mm. Hi, I think I started it. I don't know how many people are on here. <laughs> I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I love the webinars where it's just me and I'm not responsible for like network for good or charity how to or anyone else. It's just me and I'm really excited about it. Okay. So I really hope that you're all here. Audio and video good on my end. Yes. I think we're going to be a very intimate group today, which I'm excited about. Obviously you'll get the recording, but this is your chance. Ask questions, throw them my way. Let me know what you're thinking. I'm going to share my screen um, in just a minute. I just want to welcome all of you to this webinar. I really also want to thank you so much for purchasing a copy of my new book and for supporting me. We made the number one bestseller list in nonprofits um, on Amazon. And we were like number three in best new releases for some other category. I don't know. The Amazon rankings, very strange. There were a couple in the nonprofit category that I don't think were targeted at nonprofits, but I don't know. I don't work for Amazon. I don't really get hung up on things like that, but I know that it makes it easier for other people to discover the book. And I just want you, I just want you to know, I really appreciate you. So let me know where you're watching from. Tell me, go in the chat just so I know where the chat is. Tell me where you're watching from and tell me what the weather is like where you are. The weather is gorgeous here. This is my third webinar of the day, but definitely my favorite webinar of the day because it's the one I'm completely controlling and I'm so excited. Sunny New Jersey, Centerville, Virginia. Actually, Sunny, um, Neighborhood Health in Alexandria, Virginia. Gorgeous out. Washington, D.C. Oh my goodness. Quebec City, snowing. That's amazing. Louisville. Hi, Lacey. The weather is beautiful, but the allergies are awful. That, you know, we can't, we gotta have the give and take here. Washington State. Oh, I'm going to Washington State for St. Patrick's Day. I'm not going for St. Patrick's Day. I'm going for a conference. And the county that I'm going to is where all nine deaths have happened. So I'm slightly worried, should probably pay more attention to that. I'm kind of in denial a little bit. Washing my hands, wiping down everything, doing everything that I normally do. And, you know, just really not trying to think about it. Brown County Humane Society in Nashville, Indiana. I really want to go to Indiana. Absolutely gorgeous here. Love it. West Africa. I know, Jennifer, I don't know if you know that I was in the Peace Corps in Senegal for two and a half years. Love West Africa. Um, sunny and warm. We skipped winter. Dallas, Texas, rainy. Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, wow. We've got such an awesome group. Okay, so I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. I do. I just want to say thank you again for being here with me. I'm so excited to have you. And yeah, let's just share my screen. Let's get to the good stuff. So today we're going to talk about my online fundraising formula, um, my step-by-step -step guide to planning and launching online fundraising campaigns. And I always forget to turn the camera off because I think it's distracting. I will do the camera again at the end when I take your questions. Okay, great. So as you're coming in, you know, make sure you introduce yourself, let us know where you are watching from, let us know, you know, your questions. I'm going to try to monitor questions during, during the event. Oh, look, I've got the chat up. The technology is all working. Schenectady, New York. Hi, Amy. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in Schenectady April 16th. I'm really excited. Um, that's where a lot of my family's from, Schenectady and Albany. Fun fact. All right. So let's get to it. Let's just get to it. And you're going to get the slides. You'll get the recording. You'll get everything. You know how I roll. Ooh, Pam and, oh yeah, hi Pam. And I don't know how to pronounce Shamhavi's name. And I really hope that I am pronouncing it correctly. From Beloit, Wisconsin. Love it. Yes, Shamhavi. Good. Yes. I know that it must be so annoying when people say, I can't pronounce your name, but I just always like to be respectful because I was calling one of my clients. Her name is Car. Her name is Carrie, K-A-R-I. And I was calling her Kari forever. And I feel like that was 
just a problem on my part. Um, oh, Marianne says, looking forward to the session. Your new book is fantastic. I love it. I thank you so much for that. It's like having a baby. I have two books. I have two kids. And I actually, I mean, this is going to be kind of controversial. I have a husband who has a cold, basically like another child, right? I'm so sorry to say that. God, I hope he can't hear me. He's downstairs. Men, when they have colds, it's like the end of the world. So I am a mom of two or a mom of four. If you count my two books, um, Christine says, I agree. The book was awesome. Oh, I'm so excited. Thank you. I was in Senegal, 2000, 2002, return Peace Corps volunteer, wrote a couple of books. And if you don't know who I am, I would, I, most of the people that I see on the webinar, I think, you know, who I am, but if you don't know who I am, I do come from the nonprofit development world. I've been a development slash marketing director. I have been a duties as assigned director. I've managed volunteers. I've managed programs. I've pretty much done it all. So I know where you're coming from. And I really want to give you some tactical, actionable information today that you can take back to your organization. If you want to tweet along, feel free. I'm not going to tell you to take your phones away. I'm at Julia C. Social. I really like Twitter. I kind of culled my Twitter recently, got rid of a lot of the negativity on there and I love it lately. I really want to thank you so much. Everyone on this webinar, you emailed me, you sent me your receipts, you told me you love the book or you, you know, you told me you bought the book. Now I have another ask for you. If you could leave a review on Amazon, that would be amazing. Now, the reason why is that it does help other people when they're considering purchasing the book. So just one thing you learned or two sentences really quick, it does really help. It helps it get into search results. It helps the book get seen by more people, but also it really helps you. You know, when you are buying a book or for instance, I was just buying a wig on Amazon because it's my friend's birthday party on St. Patrick's day. I immediately read the reviews. Everybody goes to Amazon. They read the reviews if a book has no reviews, then people really, they just are kind of skeptical of it. So I want, I don't want you to necessarily give you, give me five stars. That's not what I'm asking. Leave an honest review and constructive and just make sure that, you know, you're talking to, to your peers. You're telling your peers like, yes, this is a book that's worth your time. We know that time is worth way more than money. Time is the most important thing that we have. Can't get it back. So what we will cover today. Oh, Tim says, I was the first person to review it. Yay. Oh, and I don't, don't mind. I don't mind all caps. It's fine. I, I get it. I, you were yelling. You were excited. It was fine. Okay. What will we cover today? We're going to cover the four phases of online fundraising campaigns that slay planning and preparation, launching with a bang, keeping momentum with a campaign calendar, and then strategic follow-up after the campaign ends. So the slides are up on SlideShare. You just go to my SlideShare account. I'm Julia Gulia 77. I signed up for it a million years ago. So that's why I have my Julia Gulia name, but the slides are up. I will also probably put them on my blog. So stay tuned for that, but just know if for some reason you can't access them, I am happy to email you the slides. So um, they're on my slide chair if you just go look up my name. And I will send you an email after this with the recording and with the slides. So I want to talk briefly about the online landscape in 2020. And you know, if you have ever seen me talk, I really don't like these. I don't like these infographics. I think they're very scary. But the point being, the attention span of a typical person entering 2020 is incredibly scattered. Now I'm reading a fantastic book called um, Digital, what is it? Digital Simplification. And I'm reading another great book on Facebook. And I have been very intentional about trying to limit my mindless scrolling on social media and all these other sites. And I think that's the trend that we're going towards. So you know that I think less is more. That's my mantra, that's what I always proselytize to you. But I don't want you to get hung up on these numbers because we're not considering these numbers. We're thinking about where we are 
where strategically we need to be and where our donors are, especially for an online fundraising campaign. The truth is that the majority of Americans do still use Facebook. They do still use YouTube. Baby boomers are on there too. Don't you write off those baby boomers. Don't you write off those Gen Xers um, and those millennials. Uh, they still use social media and Gen Z as well, whether or not it's a different platform than we're used to, you know, that remains to be seen or that is being seen. But I just don't think we can write off entire generations of people based on their age. The other thing is that a lot of NGOs are using email, they're using social media. These are just some benchmark benchmarking for you. So actually the Global NGO Technology Report has been released. It's really great. If you want to look at where you are with other organizations, it's at fundraise.org slash tech report. In terms of social media, what I found was interesting is that so many organizations are sharing Instagram stories and Facebook stories. I'm not seeing them. I wish more organizations were. Using Instagram Live, purchasing ads, tweeting hashtags, tweet chats, these are all kind of up and coming tools that people are using. So definitely take a look. I mean, all of this can augment your online fundraising campaign. None of this is prescriptive and none of this means that you have to do it. It just means I know that a lot of you have questions about where you are relative to other organizations in your space. And the $2 billion number about Facebook charitable giving, I was just at the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising forum in Austin, Texas, and a little birdie told me that it's up to $4 billion. So $4 billion raised since their inception. We can't ignore it anymore. So when you're starting out in online fundraising, how do you choose the best platforms for your small nonprofit? Now, a really great litmus test is to ask these questions. Is your audience there? Can you add value? Are you just adding more noise? What can you post on this channel that's interesting and unique as opposed to everything else you're posting on every other channels? And why are you using this channel specifically? You don't need to be everywhere. Really, you don't. You need to master one channel and then bring another channel into the fold. We don't need to be all things to all people. Now, this is TikTok. What you want to consider is if you can design and create content specific to that channel. So for instance, with TikTok, it's video based and it's mostly lip syncing and it's mostly music and it's mostly meme culture. So if you're just thinking like, oh, I have a great YouTube video, I'm gonna throw it up on Instagram stories and TikTok, it's not gonna work. Each channel is its own unique culture, its own country, it has its own language. You really have to examine if you have the capacity to add another channel into the mix. You have to do your research. You have to have knowledge of the channel. You have to be able to create that content that's gonna engage people on that channel. And then you do have to spend a little bit of time on measurement and analysis. That's very important. And I just did an entire webinar this morning with Network for Good on how to choose metrics and how to determine your social media success. Because if we're just spinning our wheels, okay, great. Sometimes you're community building. Sometimes you're on TikTok or Snapchat or Instagram, and there's no direct correlation to, is this a follower that's going to give me a donation? I, I see that. I don't think that community building is a waste of time. But what I do think is that if we're not creating some kind of rubric where we can measure and analyze what we're doing strategically, then we're not improving. We're not improving what we're doing. So you know my mantra, less is more, focus over frantic. I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page before we go through the four phases. So the four phases of successful online fundraising campaigns, first phase, planning, planning and preparation. This is why the major, I wouldn't say the majority, I can't say the majority. This is why quite a few Giving Tuesday campaigns fall flat. There's no planning. It's Giving Tuesday. So they say, we'll throw up an email, we'll throw up a post. Doesn't work. Launching with a bang, because on launch day, you're going to raise probably 50%, maybe 25, 50% of your goal. You're going to raise 25 to 50% of what you're going to raise total. 
launch day is huge. People love things that are new. They love things that are launching. Just the reality of human nature. Momentum. So that doesn't mean you can launch and then your campaign is going on for three weeks and you don't post anything until the last day. How to keep momentum and then strategy, which is, this is looking long-term. I mean, we can't just think about this as a transaction. We have to think about this as building a relationship with long-term donors. So before you begin, it's important to spend some time building your community for online fundraising. So what donors want to see, they want to see impact and success stories. That's what they want to see from us. And they keep telling us this and somehow we keep ignoring this, but we need to understand what our audience wants to see from us when we're not asking them for anything. And this Venn diagram I share all the time, probably in every presentation. It's from Mark Phillips on the Queer Ideas po uh, blog. It's amazing. What I love about it is that we get so wrapped up in the left-hand side, the things that we want to tell a donor. And donors get wrapped up on the right-hand side in the purple. But really, where we come together, the thread tying everything that we do together is how we help solve a problem. These are the kind of communications that you need to share. Before organizing a, an online fundraising campaign, you do need to understand your audience. You know, what do they value? What do they want to know more about? What motivates them? Where are their knowledge gaps? Where are their misconceptions? And this is not based on our agenda. This is not, oh, we wish they knew that. This is what do they want to know about the problem, about the work that we're doing. And Seth Godin said famously, and you know I love Seth Godin, if you followed any of my work, he said that Kickstarter should be called Kick Finisher. I completely agree because you don't go on Kickstarter with no audience and no community built up. You go on Kickstarter because you have a group of people that are interested in what you're doing that are hopefully gonna spread the word to other like-minded individuals. And that's because the work of building a community is in the beginning. So we know a little bit about building a community, that's what my book is about, but I just wanted to reiterate that it's really hard to start from scratch when you're doing an online fundraising campaign. You can do surveys to ask your audience what they want. You can ask great questions. I love what the San Antonio Zoo did. We have to get creative. We have to grab attention. We have to do things that are unexpected. Name a cockroach after them and it will be fed to zoo animals on Valentine's Day. I mean, how amazing is that? Talk about milestones even if you have confidentiality issues. There's ways to build community. You don't have to share the faces and names and identifying details of all of your clients or any of your clients. Share these little mission moments. Make me feel happy. Make me feel like this is an organization that I want to participate in. This is how you build community. You show up, you talk about impact, you share quotes, you share stories, and you build this community of people, this is an Instagram story, that then you can turn to when you are running this online fundraising campaign. So step one, planning and preparation. So building a community needs to be ongoing throughout everything that you do. Building a community is not something that you're gonna check off your list ever. It never gets checked off. It's always on your list. So you're continually doing this like concurrently with all of these different phases. First phase, get your website ready. You're going to be sending a lot of people to your website with this online fundraising campaign. So get it ready. Maybe you're going to use a third party website like Classy or Cosvox, but get your website ready if you're going to be using your website. Make sure there are donation amounts. You want to eliminate um, analysis paralysis, you want to eliminate, um, eliminate decision fatigue. You also want to make things absurdly easy to accomplish and carry out on mobile devices and any other device that people are using. I love this. Give a little to make a big impact. You'd be surprised at how far we can stretch a dollar. Considering, consider having a landing page for your campaign where the only thing that people can do is donate. 
You want to eliminate distractions. You want to set up your website to maximize conversions. Conversions mean the percentage of people that go to your website and then make a donation because you're going to get a number of people obviously going to your website and then not making a donation for whatever reason. But you want to maximize the number of people that actually do end up making that decision. So you can choose outside platforms if you need to for your fundraising campaign. So this could be Facebook. Maybe you want to run the whole thing on Facebook. Maybe you just want to use it as a piece of your campaign. YouTube has giving tools. Um, I really like Cosvox and CrowdRise and Classy for outside um, platforms where you can raise money for your online fundraising campaign. There's so many out there. Fundraise is a great one. Rallybound is a great one. I just think that there's so many outside platforms that you can use. You can use your website or you can use a standalone fundraising campaign. With Facebook fundraisers, what I wanted to point out is that not only are they pretty ubiquitous and popular and kind of getting normalized into society, which I like, um, but 88% of people that have donated through Facebook say they're likely to give again through Facebook. So I think this represents a complete revolution in how people are donating, let alone how people are discovering information and communicating with each other. So this is in the 2019 Global Giving Report. Really, really cool. And I want to emphasize that when Facebook did a study of how of the organizations that were most successful raising money on Facebook, they found that pages with 1,000 to 10,000 fans did the best in terms of money raised versus number of fans. I think that's amazing. So you don't have to have a page with 10 million fans in order to get a lot of Facebook engagement and Facebook donations. Now, the way you want to incorporate this when you're doing your planning phase is make sure you set it up. So you want to make sure you set it up. You want to make sure that your donors and your supporters know that this is an option. You want to explain the benefits to them. You want to make sure that they know that it's a possibility, that they know that Facebook doesn't take any of the fees, all of those frequently asked questions. And then you can give them advice and tips and tricks for setting up an, um, a successful fundraiser. And we know what it takes to set up a successful fundraiser. It takes a great headline, a great visual, and a compelling story. It's like anything in fundraising. Great headline to capture attention, compelling story, and ease of use. And if you want to thank your Facebook fundraisers afterwards, I have a lot of examples of organizations that do this. If you're worried that you're not going to be able to thank them, then here are some examples of how you can maybe thank them. I just want to encourage you to look at these tools and see if they're a good fit for you and if they can enhance your online fundraising campaign. So when you're planning in the planning phase, you are evaluating all of these tools to figure out if they're a good fit. Maybe the Instagram donation sticker is a good fit. Go to the Malala Fund, look at their fundraising highlight in their Instagram stories. They walk people through how to add the sticker and why it's a good idea. So if this is a tool that you're saying, yes, I wanna use it, you do need to have some things in place to tell people how they're going to use it. You can't just set it up and expect people to come. It's totally Bull Durham. Is that, no, Field of Dreams. Sorry, I'm getting my Kevin Costner movies confused. If you build it, they will come. It's not like that. And we know this. Make it fun, make it exciting, show people how to use it, okay? Um, Tim says, do you have any thoughts about Network for Goods donor management system, which also has donation pages for your website? I've never worked with um, Network for Good, so I don't know. Does anyone else use Network for Good as their donor management system? I just can't personally speak for that. Paige says we do. Um, I know that Network for Good works a lot with Facebook. Paige says we love it, easy to use. So there you go. So if anyone else uses Network for Good, let me know. Bad, good, ugly, I'd love to know. I just haven't personally used it with any clients. I do love Network for Good um, as a vendor. I think they're great people to work with, but I have never used it to manage donations. Okay, in the, in the planning phase, at least three months out, 
conduct research. What's going on? What are the partners and others in the industry doing? Form a committee, just like any other event, you'd form an event committee, set a date for when you want to launch, and then create the work plan. This is who's going to do what when, working backwards from the date. You want to create a strategy to recruit people um, that are going to spread the word for you and also raise money for you. You can call them something more fun than online fundraising ambassadors. Maybe they're donors, maybe they're volunteers, maybe they're literally five people that you identify. How are you going to reach them? Who are they? What do you want them to do? And then how are you going to keep them activated and engaged throughout the campaign? One month out, you want to tease the launch, create a calendar that you're going to use every single day of the campaign so you don't wake up every morning and say, oh my gosh, what are we going to post today? And then the measurement spreadsheet, which is just to make sure that you're hitting the goals. Maybe you have engagement goals or new donor goals. There might be other goals other than just fundraising. You know, there might be other goals. This is a great way to tease it. I love impact goals. So impact goals are, you know, they're not telling you in this post how much money. They're telling you the impact goal. We want to build 25 schools around the world. To me, that's a lot more impactful than saying we want to raise $500,000. $500,000 sounds really large to me, especially if I'm a $25 donor. Think about creating an impact goal and organizing your campaign around that. And then depending on your capacity, but of course you're going to be doing this way before you launch your campaign, you want to develop the collateral. So this is everything you're going to use to promote your campaign. Posts, videos, photos, graphics, templates, PR. You might only use maybe two or three things on this list, or you might use the whole list. But make sure you're making a list of every single thing you need to create, all the channels you're on, your email, your website, every potential communications list, every potential communications avenue that you're gonna be leveraging. Here are some examples of some great posts. You could easily create these ahead of time. So not all of these graphics have to be created the day of or on the fly. You could easily do this with Canva or Adobe Spark or WordSwag or Over or any number of graphic design tools. Make sure you have some of these kind of posts lined up and ready to go so you're not so stressed out when you are actually running and launching the campaign. Okay, so step two, now that you have everything a little bit prepared, you do want to have some white space in there. You don't want to have every single post automated, but you do want to have a little bit of content created so that you're not losing sleep. Now launch day. Launch day is huge. Before the public launch, make sure you're not launching to zero. So what I don't want to see is you are using, say, CrowdRise or Indiegogo or GoFundMe or whatever it is for your campaign. And you send out the launch email. I'm all excited. I go there and it's at zero. That's, I don't want to see that. I don't really care. I'm always the first at the buffet. I will see the tip jar. I don't care personally. A lot of people care about that. It's just human nature. So seed the, the um, I was going to say seed the tip jar. Make sure there's some donations in the coffer before you launch to everybody. Make sure staff and board members make donations first. Anyone asking for money, I better see them up on that donor board. I better see their name. If they're asking me for money, they better have given money. And, I, and also with an online fundraising campaign, you usually can see the names of the people that have participated. So it's, it's easy to be anonymous, but it's also kind of hard to be anonymous. Your launch day email is so important. I want you to rewrite it 50 times and choose, write 30 different subject lines. So you, have, you can write the same iteration 30 times. Your subject line of your email on launch day, it really could make or break your campaign because first of all, is it going to be delivered? Secondly, is it going to get opened? And is your launch email compelling? It has to be because you're launching something. 
after the launch email, people are going to start saying, okay, well, it's a fundraising campaign and your email opens might drop off for a little while and that's normal, but your launch email is so important. You have to get people excited. You have to pique their interest. Tell them about a match if you have a match. Drive people directly where you want them to go. And what I recommend doing is to really ramp up buzz around the campaign calling people, taking a video of you calling people and thanking them. Um, whether or not you love Elizabeth Warren or not, I love her social media videos where it's her calling people and thanking them for their donation. I love those videos. They're so awesome. And of course she has to ask for permission and all that, but do that. Post those. Thank people. Just a great way to get interaction and get some more buzz and some more excitement around the campaign. Make sure the thank you email that you're sending to new donors is impactful and interesting. You've changed lives. You've done this. We did this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please know that, you know, this is what your money's going to. Feeding America, the No Kid Hungry campaign on Giving Tuesday in 2018, they did a live thankathon on Periscope, which is linked to Twitter, and they had a whole wall where they just thanked people for giving to the campaign and they put their names on little sticky notes and you can see they put their major donors and their corporate sponsors on bigger sticky notes. And then once in a while they would have someone come stand in front of the live stream and say, thank you so much to XYZ for giving. Love it. I love any way that you can build a community and really get people involved, but also thank your donors. So all hands are on deck on launch day. You're announcing the campaign on Facebook specifically. You're going to pay to boost that post that launches the campaign. So more of your fans see it. You're going to upload the video and not share a link if you do have a video. And then you're going to entice people and encourage them to start Facebook fundraisers for you to contribute to the bottom line on Twitter. You're going to do the same thing, announce it, upload the video, schedule tweets for launch day. But of course, you're not going to just write the same tweet 50 times, but you're going to schedule some tweets and then thunderclap. You're going to use a software to really to um, get everybody tweeting at the same time and get everyone using the same language. Like I said, all hands on deck. I do recommend using live video on launch day only because it's going to get the most traction and views and eyeballs for you. So you can promote it before launch day. You could just go live serendipitously and spontaneously and um, make sure you say we have a big announcement. We're so excited to do this. World Pulse did this. And then when you update your caption or you update your comment, the people that were watching you live are going to get that notification. So make sure you're following up after the Facebook Live ends for the people that are gonna catch the Facebook Live not when it's live because a live video lives on your stream and lives on your page and a lot more people are gonna watch it when it's not live. Like they did not get 1,319 people watching live. They might've gotten 60, but the way the Facebook algorithm works is that you're going to get a lot more views after the video is done. And you can add a donate button to your live video. If you're going live for a significant amount of time, I do recommend adding that donate button. You can also add it and people can make donations as they go. Just make sure you call it out in your Facebook live and say, hi everybody. I'm so excited to let you know that we're starting our campaign. We want to build 25 schools. Click that donate button that you can donate in two clicks. Make sure you share with your friends. Let people know what to do. Tell people what to do. They need to know what to do. If you don't have the donate button, you might want to think about setting up a text to give option because we have to think about how people are using social media. They're predominantly on their phones, um, on their mobile devices. So think about incorporating something that's super easy for them to do. Now, this is important because if you put a link to Facebook to a, if you put a link to an outside website, Facebook is not going to show it to as many people as if you just put some text in the caption um, and put a photo there. So this is sort of how you can use Twitter. Make sure you're using hashtags. 
Make sure you're using great visuals that are going to grab my eye and really entice me to click. I love this story. I'm a goat farmer because the goats give me everything I need. And then today, when you give to a goat farmer like Chasa, your gift will be doubled. I love language like that. These are examples of sponsored posts if you do want to run Facebook ads. Now, running Facebook ads is challenging if it's not something in the news, like on the right, the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. That is in the news. That's something that's being talked about. And on the left-hand side, the Greater Boston Food Bank, they run these around the holidays. They don't run these year-round. So be strategic with your Facebook ads if you're running Facebook ads. If it's something in the news, absolutely do a Facebook ad because people are talking about it, people know about it. And if it's around the holidays and it's something around hunger and around families, absolutely. Facebook ads are not necessarily for everyone, but they could augment your campaign a little bit. Um, so Nara says, do you see any negatives to using Facebook giving? Well, I think you need to evaluate it for your own organization, but it doesn't really, I mean, it doesn't really matter what I think. It, it matters what your donors think. Like, do your donors want to use it? Do they want to give that way? Is this something that they're using to raise money in their communities with their friends and families? So to me, I always think everything needs to be very, very donor specific, audience specific, and we need to be doing what our donors and our audience wants. And we need to be accessible in all the ways that they want us to be accessible. If they want to give via Venmo, set up a Venmo account. I mean, it doesn't cost anything. Um, if they want to give online, if they want to give via check, you have to take checks. You know, I can't, I don't know what to tell you. If that's what they like to do, you have to process checks. So it's really not what we like and what we think. It's what your donors and your audience thinks. And to me, the whole argument about Facebook charitable giving and you don't get the donor information, I could go on for an hour, but I'm only going to say that completely defeats the point. So if I give to a Facebook fundraiser, I'm giving to the person. Like I'm giving to that person who's trying to raise money. I'm not necessarily giving to the organization. I might eventually develop a long-term relationship, but it's on me. So we have to kind of give up that traditional model of control. Like we're in control of our list. We're in control of this. We're in control of our donors. We're not in control of anything anymore. And if we want to reach new donors, if we want to reach a brand new audience, if we want to connect with younger donors, and if we want to expand our networks, we have to be looking at these tools in um, a much better light. Just if they don't fit in with our workflow perfectly right now, it doesn't mean you know they never will. I don't believe in saying never. I believe never say never. Okay, step three, phase three. I don't wanna go more than an hour today. All right, so keep up the momentum. This is where you're gonna continue promoting your campaign. I mean, you have to have enthusiasm the entire campaign. You can't just have enthusiasm on launch day and then on the last day of the campaign. This is keeping everyone motivated and accountable. This is capturing contact information. See what's working. Check out your ads. If you're doing ads, check out your social media. See what's working. See what can be improved and tweak as you go. And then also have fun. Have fun. This is where we have the white space. This is where you take a video in the office throwing confetti and saying, we met our goal. We're halfway to our goal. Thank you so much to XYZ donor who got us over the hump. And make sure you're sending frequent updates on the campaign progress. You know, thank you to everyone who celebrated. This is what still needs to happen. Make your gift today so we can reach our goal. Now, my only note with this one is that, first of all, I do love Girls Inc. They're one of my favorite organizations. But helping them reach their goal is not super compelling to me. I want to help them, you know, make girls stronger, smarter, and bolder. So think about the language you're using. Is it all about you or is it all about what your donor wants to accomplish? Oh, Best Friends Animal Society. I love this, not just because it has a dog. I mean, I'm an animal person, but I like that it says specifically, can you give just $5? Click 
the donate button below. So it does two things. One, it eliminates analysis paralysis. It helps me process like, oh yeah, I can give $5. And then because of the way this is going to look on a phone, I might not see the donate button. I might not know the donate button is there. So they're calling it out. Click the donate button below. This is a screenshot from a desktop. Same with um, St. Baldrick's. Donate $5 to support Abby's five years of fighting. Being specific. Text love to donate $10. If you are specific, I guarantee you're going to get more donations because you're going to eliminate that decision fatigue. We all have decision fatigue, especially by the end of the day. That's why Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and they all wear hoodies and t-shirts and jeans every day because they don't want to take brain power deciding what to wear. Now we might not all have that luxury, but as many ways as you can eliminate that decision from people and make things super easy, that's going to get you the most money. And then step four is strategic follow-up. So we can't just assume that these online donors are going to be with us forever. So we need to have a plan to cultivate them. We need to communicate the results of the campaign. What happened? If you didn't reach your goal, you still need to tell people. If you didn't reach your goal, you still need to tell people because the donors that donated are going to feel really crappy if you just decide, oh, I'm going to write off this campaign because we only got 7,000 towards our $10,000 goal. How do I feel if I'm a donor that contributed to that campaign? You still have to be excited. You still have to tell them what's going to happen to the next $3,000 and you still have to show them that you appreciate the money that was given. Show the progress. I love those live and public thank yous, calling out donors, tagging donors, messaging people, just being very strategic and having a plan to cultivate these new donors, not just sort of sending out an email receipt, an automated email receipt. That's definitely not enough to cultivate these new donors. They have a lot of options and they have a lot of choices and they decided to support you. I love the idea of having a virtual campaign celebration. You could do it on Facebook Live. You could do it on Google Hangouts, um, have a live countdown and people just get really excited. Make sure you let people know that the campaign is ending. You know, if your matching gift is almost ending, you definitely want to let people know. Where's the urgency? Where's the relevancy? Where's the timeliness? And then I really always recommend calling everybody, all your new donors, especially during a campaign. So you might not have the capacity and good for you if you're having, if you have that many donors and you don't even have the capacity. But Penelope Burke in her research on donor-centric fundraising, she found that a lot of donors use these kinds of campaigns as testing grounds. So they have more money to give. I'm not going to give you the most I can give the very first time you ask me for money. I'm going to give you 10 bucks, maybe 25 bucks. I'm going to test it out. I'm going to see what happens. And if you send me a timely email, if you show me that there was a clear impact, and if I feel connected to the cause, then I might make a bigger donation. But please, can we not write people off just because they gave us $5? That's why small dollar donors are disappearing. Absolutely. Um, create the welcome email campaign, share the impact, share stories from real people in real situations. Um, Tim says, how do you recommend capturing donor phone numbers? There's really no way you can make people give their phone number, but on the donation form, you can have it be an option. And certainly if they give it to you, then you want to call them because that means they want to call. I mean, the majority of people in this day and age might not give it to you, but if they do give it to you, by all means, make sure you call them. And you might have some returning donors that you already have their phone numbers in the database. Um, and even Penelope Burke found that even leaving a voicemail can be just as impactful. But if you don't have a phone number, make sure you're using email or direct mail or some way that you have to communicate the impact, to communicate the stories, get people more involved immediately. Maybe you ask for their feedback. Maybe you ask them to do something low touch, like be a social media ambassador, get them more involved immediately. 
some tools that you can use that I talk about all the time. I, I gave you the links to the nonprofit discount page. Canva is for graphic design, Animoto for editing video, Word Swag for creating, like you see on the right, these great little graphics. You have to have a visual with every post. For scheduling, I use Hootsuite, I use Buffer. Buzzsumo is a fantastic, um, a fantastic platform to look up what's trending, to look up what other people are posting on, and to look up influencers. And then I really encourage you, and I will spend some time, I'll spend about five, 10 minutes answering questions if anyone has questions. Just remember at the end of the day what donors want. So these, this is what sets campaigns and sustainable fundraising programs apart from kind of flash in the pan fundraising programs. The ones that are sustainable, they really remember what donors want. Donors want to make a meaningful life. They want to be involved. They want to give back. They want to make a difference. And they want to see that this problem, this injustice, this something that they care about, it's being addressed. They want to be heard. They want to not feel alone. They don't want to be screaming into the void. Um, but I think the most important piece of this is they want to create a meaningful life. And you're helping them do that. So never feel smarmy or um, scummy or spammy about helping people create a meaningful life. As long as we give them evidence of the impact, story of, stories of lives changed, opportunities to get more involved, and chances to spread the word, that's what's really going to help build our long-term audience at the end of the day. All right. I, oh, I wanted to go 45 minutes. I went 46. I want to answer some questions and I would love to, I'm going to send you the slides and definitely send you the recording. So if anyone has any questions, make sure you're typing them into the chat, into the questions box. Um, and this is your chance because it's a pretty intimate group. It's only for people that emailed me the receipt. And then of course, not everybody shows up live, which is totally fine with me. So, oh, Andrea says, I left a review for you on Amazon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, oh, great. Um, Nara says, can you talk a little about Facebook ads versus boosting? Yes. So boosting is when you have an existing post that you've posted to your page and you just want to give it a little more juice to get it seen by more people. That's the best way to use boosting. So what I tend to do, and actually I just did this in my, I'm going to show you the back end of my Facebook here. I just did this in a webinar. So if you go to your insights, um, you got to search a little bit for it because of course, why would they make it easy? You can see your most popular posts. Where are posts? Okay. So what I recommend doing, don't boost posts that are very low in engagement because people are giving you real-time feedback. But like this one, my new book is out today, absolutely boost it because you can see it's getting a lot of engagement. So I would post something and leave it for a little bit and then see how much engagement it's getting. And then if it's getting a lot of engagement, kind of push it over the edge with a boosted post. A Facebook ad is something you create that never lives on your Facebook page, but it is a specific ad targeted to a specific group of people. So they're a little bit different. Um, Brenna says, do you have experience with text to donate campaigns or strong opinions about them? Well, I, I don't know. So it depends because it depends on your audience. Um, I know that some groups like the Humane Society and Feeding America, they've had really huge success with text to give campaigns, but that's because they promote them everywhere. They use them consistently. What you can't do is sign up for a tool and then use it once and then say it's a failure. So you have to kind of commit to a tool and use it all the time. I do like text to sign up tools. So I use one called Textiful. And that's the one, if you've ever seen me talk in a webinar and I say, text the word social media to 33777, those work amazingly well to get people's emails. 
But text to give, I, I've never really given via text to give because I usually give via Facebook or I give via Venmo or something like that. But I do know that if it's a tool that you're committed to using, you should 100% commit to it and you can't just kind of put something up um, and then saying, oh, it didn't work because I used it for five minutes. Oh, Judy, I'm so excited that you're on here. Okay. I love, yes, you love the comment you made about treating all donors with attention and respect. How much should a small organization budget for boosts? <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, I would start out with 50 bucks and I would have serious, um, ROI for that. Like I would say, okay, we want to boost this and boost posts that you can track, like boost a post that goes to a donate page or boost a post that goes to an event page, boost a post that goes to a video. So you can track and say, okay, we got this many video views. We had this many event signups. We had this many email signups. That's what I would recommend doing in the beginning. Um, but you could even, you could do a lot of damage and be dangerous with $50, even just a small um, organization. All right, John says, minimum number of volunteer fundraisers do you recommend to be effective? Um, best practices to grow volunteer fundraisers. Well, what is your goal? So if you want to raise $50,000 on Giving Tuesday, you're going to need a lot of volunteer fundraisers. But if you want to raise $2,000, then maybe you only need a handful. So you have to work backwards from your goal. But if you're talking about people that are going to raise money for you, the very first thing you need to do is give them the tools. You need to have a toolkit on your website or some kind of PDF toolkit you can give them to say, thank you so much for being a volunteer fundraiser. Here are the top five things that you can do. Here are more resources for you. Here are some photos. Here are some videos. So just make things incredibly easy for them so that they don't have to be searching all over your website for information. And so they can turn to you kind of as a go-to resource. Um, oh, look at Paige said, Judy, we started with 30 to 50 a month and tracked analytics to see if we needed to boost or cut back. Awesome. Perfect. Kristen, hi, Kristen, said, any advice when working with multiple organizations? Oh, in a regional campaign, so like a giving day? Um, well, first of all, if you're doing a giving day or you're all working on the same fundraising campaign, you do have to have, I would have some kind of webinar, I would have a toolkit, I would make sure everybody is on the same page with the messaging. I would give them the top five best practices for online fundraising and just, you know, help lift each other up because some of the organizations are going to be a little more savvy, maybe pair up organizations if in a regional campaign. So pair up a savvy seasoned organization with a tiny newbie organization, or maybe pair people up that are not kind of direct competitors. I don't like the word competitor, but you know, you don't want to pair up a museum with a museum. Maybe you do. I don't know. But I, I think maybe pairing up a seasoned fundraiser with a newbie, showing them the ropes, and certainly just always giving them the resources that they need to succeed, whether that be a toolkit or a webinar or access to information about the campaign and the stories um, that are, you know, the, the why, the why of the campaign, like, why are we doing this? That's so important because if organizations, no matter if it's a giving day or if it's an individual fundraising campaign or if it's a tiny, small nonprofit, if people are not on board with the why, they will never be on board with the how and the what. So you're going to tell them all day what you're doing, but you need to get them on board with why you are doing it. Okay, I'm going to take one last question and it's from Tim. He says, any suggestions for how many online fundraising campaigns a nonprofit can do in a year without inducing donor fatigue? I recommend maybe, so what I recommend with small, 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 small organizations is doing maybe four dedicated fundraising pushes a year. I mean, it doesn't mean you're going to be sending donors away if, you can't, if um, they decide to donate to you. But then, you know, big organizations like St. Jude, they have a donate button on every email. They have donate buttons all over the place. They have people running fundraisers for them all every day of the year. And some organizations 
have strategies around birthday fundraisers, have strategies around how to really entice people to donate their anniversary um, and all of that kind of thing. So what I would recommend is looking at on the calendar where you think you could do like a two week, three week fundraising campaign, <coughs> all hands on deck, and then spending the rest of the year really focused on um, community building and building up your audience. I'm sorry, the third webinar of the day. <laughs> so I'm, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice a little bit, but there's really no one size fits all. But I think the best piece of advice I can give you is look at your capacity, see where you might be able to fit campaigns in nicely. Maybe you have something that is around mothers. I know when I worked at the domestic violence shelter, we had a big campaign around Mother's Day, which is in May. And then we had a big campaign in October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And then we had a big campaign around year end. So it just kind of made sense for us. So I don't think, I think donor fatigue, this is kind of a controversial opinion. I kind of think donor fatigue is a myth. Like Penelope Burke talks about this and I'm just like on a high from her because I just saw her speak in person. But we get fatigued because we don't ever hear from charities unless they're asking us for money. So if you're communicating with your donors consistently about your impact and about what their gift helped to achieve, you know, yes, if you're asking them every day, but obviously we're not doing that. But I don't think that if you're asking them a few times a year to support a cause that they care about and to contribute to alleviating a problem that they care about, I really don't think they're going to get fatigued. They get fatigued when the only time they hear from you is your annual appeal in December. Yes, I get fatigued by that too. That's when they get fatigued. And on that note, I'm going to end this webinar. I'm so glad, Judy, you watch us on your phone and you say, I love Zoom. I don't know why anyone does not use Zoom. Zoom is my favorite. I love it. Um, and I totally meant to answer the questions with the video on. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so you could actually see my face. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Please, you know, leave a review on Amazon if you want. If not, that's fine. Let me know how it goes. And I'll be doing a lot more free webinars this year. Um, and I really hope that, you know, you enjoy the book. You're doing amazing, amazing work. You're changing the world. And I just really appreciate all of you connecting with me. So take care and um, have a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you so much.